In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. On Thursday morning, a flatbed truck pulled onto Rectory Street. It was piled high with fresh, fragrant, evergreen trees, 320 of them. On Friday afternoon, the unloaded trees were sorted and staged by Christ Church volunteers, and yesterday, we held our ninth annual Christ Church Christmas tree sale. To the tune of chainsaws and Christmas pop music, trees of all sizes were carefully selected and then secured to car rooftops to be taken home and trimmed with lights and ornaments and each will become the centerpiece of a traditional family Christmas. The Christ Church Christmas tree sale, uh, as some of you may know, uh, was the brainchild of parishioners Nicole and Francis Jenkins and Lizzie and Eric Balmer, and they envisioned a festive fundraiser that would benefit our community while also creating a hands-on opportunity to support the mission of this church, and I mean hands-on. The success of those early years prompted two more parish families, the Sites and the Howards, to come on board, and over the years, the sale has tripled in size. The tree sale is, is not only an important contributor to the parish budget, it is also an enormous, and exhausting labor of love and a brilliant example of how creativity and vision can translate into a signature event that brings church and community together. And the timing of the sale on the weekend of Rye England Sunday and the second Sunday of Advent is the perfect opportunity for a preacher to consider trees as integral to our Christmas as well as our Christian story. And I'm thinking in particular of two trees, the Christmas tree, of course, and also the Jesse tree. But let's start with the Christmas tree. Four centuries, historians say for millennia, people of different cultures have taken plants and branches that remain green all year long and brought them inside for various reasons. Some believed evergreens would protect them from evil spirits. Others used the greens for winter solstice festivities, marking the turn from darkness and cold to longer days and the promise of springtime. And still others used greenery in worship as a symbol of the everlasting life of their gods. The Christmas tree tradition as we know it today began in earnest in 16th century Germany when Christian families brought entire evergreen trees into their homes and adorned them with ribbons and sweets and other things of beauty. And the distinctive triangle shape of many evergreen trees was thought by some to represent the Holy Trinity. Protestant reformer Martin Luther is credited as the first to add lights to the tree branches in honor of Christ's birth. After marveling one Christmas Eve at the beauty of the stars shining through snow-covered branches on his way home from work. But it took a very long time for the Christmas tree to make its way to our shores. And this has largely become because the Puritans forbade any joyful, frivolous merriment that might mar the sacred observance of Christmas, including decorations of any kind. Then, in 1846, a sketch of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children gathered inside around a Christmas tree appeared in the London News, and the image went viral, <laughs> which in 19th century terms means it was reprinted at a later date in an American monthly magazine. <laughs> but back then, Whatever was fashionable in the English court became instantly desirable here in America. So before long, it was de rigueur to have a full-size Christmas tree in the American home. Now, for many of us, the ritual of decorating a Christmas tree invites history into the present moment. Maybe it's the 
ornaments themselves. You know, you find something handmade by a child who is now a college student, or you unwrap a fragile bauble made out of fr frosted glass that somebody's great great grandmother brought to this country, and miraculously, no descendants have yet smashed. And as we go through these familiar motions of tree trimming, we remember things that we don't think about the rest of the year. And we often experience the presence of friends and family long gone who loved Christmas so much that it seems impossible that they're no longer with us. The Christmas tree is a living thing brought to perfection as it draws deeper meaning from our past to become each year something entirely new. But there's a second, less well-known tree story in the Christmas tradition, and that is the Jesse tree, named for our reading this morning from the 11th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. It begins, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Jesse tree is a visual representation of the lineage of Jesus. It's Jesus' family tree. It traces our Lord's genealogy back through Hebrew scripture beyond King David of Israel to his father, Jesse, patriarch of the royal family of the house of David. And church art, particularly from the medieval period, depicts the Jesse tree in stained glass and illuminated manuscripts, and it served to teach those who could not read the Bible about Jesus the Messiah's royal background, which was critical to the church's understanding of his birth as the promised fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So a typical depiction, portrayal of the Jesse tree shows old man Jesse reclining on the ground asleep, much like Adam was reclining asleep when God reached in and grabbed a rib to make Eve. So sleeping Jesse, uh, from his midsection, then rises the trunk of a tree or the stem of a vine. And then sprouting off the stem to the left and the right are these great leafy branches with images representing Jesus' ancestors as traced in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. At the top of the tree is Jesus, and then directly beneath him is his mother Mary. And Mary is understood to be the means by which the shoot will come out of the stump, through whom the new king will be born. In Hebrew, the word shoot can also translate as rod or scepter, so a sign of royal rule. The tree then, the Jesse tree, is, is at once a tether between past and future, as well as a living, blooming, radical sign pointing in a brand new direction toward a new fruitfulness that leaves behind whatever is hurtful and destructive in, in favor of, of harmony and hope. So Isaiah 11, then, is preparing an oppressed and suffering people for the coming of their savior, not out of the clear blue, but out of the rich soil of their ancestors and the ancient promises of God to a people who've lost their way and who now stumble around in the darkness. And the Jesse tree of the prophet Isaiah anticipates such a different kind of king to lead God's people into their future. And in some of the illustrations of the Jesse tree, the wood of the branches is seen to become the wood of the cross. So here, we have these two trees on the second Sunday of Advent, the Christmas tree and the Jesse tree. Each can be understood as a, a kind of rooting us in history, our own family history and our salvation history. And at the same time, each can be seen as beckoning us to come alive now within the traditions we inherit. Each reminds us of the mysterious and elegant economy of God that we look to our future and we see it through the lens of our past. And that God intends us to be shaped by both without getting stuck in either. Because we are ever in motion. 
We are people of the way. Which, which brings us to the message of the ultimate Advent preacher, John the Baptist, who bursts onto the scene in our gospel reading today. John is a prophet, a new prophet, for a New Testament. And he has the words of the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, alive on his lips. And these are not comfortable, comforting words. They are convicting words, charging God's people to get right, right now, because this new king they've been waiting for, he's on the way. According to John, God doesn't care how illustrious your family tree is. If it's not producing the fruits of the Spirit, if it's not a living, blossoming sign of harmony and hope, it's of no use to this new king. So past and, and future come crashing into the present, and the ax is lying there, right there in plain sight at the root of the trees. So do not get stuck, and don't take anything for granted. Amazingly, instead of being offended by John's blunt and urgent message, people flock to hear him. They know in their hearts that he's preaching the truth, and they want whatever is dark and dead in their lives and in the world to be washed away, even burned away, so that something new can grow. They are hungry. They are hungry for hope. And hope is what we are hungry for, too. Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that the message we come to church to hear today? Hope that a new green shoot will come out of the ancient traditions of our church. Hope that the values and virtues that bind us through history to our sister church in Rye, England, will sustain both of our nations through these dark and divisive times. Hope that we can trust again in the promise of Advent, that the tree of the cross is and ever shall be evergreen, eternally alive, and a sign of God's unbounded love and unending hope in us. Amen.